interview and job search strategies at work. I'm here with the motivational speaker, Mirna. How are you today, Mirna? I'm pretty good, and nice to be here again with you, Gary. Very much. Thank you. Really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Um, just, I'm going to ask you a question. So can you tell us how you got started um, with what you do now as a motivational speaker? How did you get your start? I'm, I'm curious about that story. Okay, um, to start with, actually, I would like to speak about um, women working overseas, you know. Um, I had no clue that I would be working overseas because that's not part of my dream when I was back home. Now, a lot of things change because of what happened in my life. And I had to make that big decision way back in 2003, okay. Now, as you know that, you know, we can say now that in modern times, our times, especially now, that the only constant is change. Now, women's role has changed dramatically over the decades. Now, from being domestic-oriented, child-rearing, taking care of the family, doing household chores, women started participating in different fields and has become partner to their spouse to financially provide for the family. Now, as the change in lifestyle occurs, this made women persevere and assert their independence in many aspects. Now, women would prefer to be financially independent and has proven to be successful in their chosen field while working side by side with, with our male counterparts. Now, over the years, women are becoming part of the growing statistics of work force going overseas. I, for one, you know, way back 2003, as I mentioned earlier, and that was 16 years ago, leaving my three children to work overseas was one of the most difficult choices in my life, you know, because my eldest son was just 11 at that time, and my second son was seven, and my daughter was just four. You know, it broke my heart into pieces, but I had to make that big decision because I want to make sure, I want to make, make sure that I provide for them when, with their education and everything they need, that we will be okay in time. You know, because it's a lot of preparation, like having three kids, you know, raising them on my own for a few years. It was not an easy job, you know, because my eldest son had to be a father and a mother at the same time. And he was just 11, you know. So to me, it's now I uh, look back. It's our life now is, I would say, a very fulfilling one. We still have struggles, bits and pieces here and there, but we are in a position that we understand and we love each other and we respect each other and we love what each other is doing, actually. Now, um, coming to the Middle East was a big question mark to my family, actually, because I was having a good job when I was back home. I was operations manager. And to be quite honest, coming to Kuwait is a demotion for me because I was down to a store manager position. But, you know, my perspective in life, and I always believe in that, it's not about the position. It's the fulfillment that you get out from whatever you're doing, you know. So I accepted this job thinking that I need to pick up the pieces of my life and I want to make sure I will be a good provider for my kids. And of course, uh, making sure that I find myself again. Now, why the Middle East? That's, what, that's the big question with all of my family members, you know, because I'm the only one here in the Middle East. Most of them are in Europe. My sister got married to an Italian. My aunt is in Great Britain. And most of them in Europe, actually. And it's not about just working, but they are there because their spouses are there. And also with the invasion of Iraq in 1990, they were kind of scared for me, you know, but it didn't stop me. To me, this is, I believe, 
where I will get back on my feet and find myself again and bo- be who I want to be. You know, so a big struggle on my kids because I left them with nannies. And um, I don't have my parents anymore. My sister migrated to Italy in 1995. So I had no choice but to leave them with uh, caretakers. And that was very challenging for my eldest son because my eldest son is my best friend at that time. And that's why he he didn't want to let go of my luggage bags when he was, you know, when I was about to leave for Kuwait because he said, I will be losing my, my best friend. That was really heartbreaking. But, you know, I explained to him, one day you will understand why I'm doing this. Now, let's enumerate some of the challenges and sacrifices that I and some women probably have experienced or is going through it right now, okay? Most of these are my experiences, but I'm sure some of the women out there who will be listening to this podcast could relate because living in a different country that you're not accustomed to is quite challenging. You know, number one is the period of adjustment. You know, you're adjusting a new, to a new environment, to the cultural orientation. How do I relate to the locals? How do I, you know, there's, in the Philippines, we have what we call PIDOS. In PIDOS, they actually do an orientation on the do's and don'ts before going overseas, depending on which country you're going to. But that's not enough. It's just the basic things that, you know, what do you wear and, you know, what religion do they have and and that kind of stuff. But the actual, you know, experiences, once you get there, that's the time you will get to learn about it. And, oh, that's not what they told us during the, the interview. I mean, during the orientation. So to me, the big thing is, uh, the adjustment with how the local, you know, would deal with particularly Asian, you know, because like I feel being a male dominant country, you know, they don't see women at that time when I first got here. Women is perceived to be just be at home, you know, so when they see people in the shops, in the restaurants, like women, especially like like in my case, I'm Filipino, they think all the Filipinas in Kuwait are mostly working in the house. They're not used to women who are um, straightforward, who are educated, and who would give them suggestions and object object to what they feel is right for us to do you know that's the main thing and um another struggle is like most of the establishments are actually speaking arabic so that's another big challenge for me like you know i don't speak the language and plus in the brand that i i um, handle in retail most of the Kuwaitis speak uh, English because they're well traveled they're well educated and they are well off financially one t-shirt or polo shirt in my shop is 25 kd how much is 25 kd in Philippine peso let's just say it's 175 you can do the math so one shirt is like wow worth an arm and a leg in in the Philippines. But anyway, so that's the main thing. So I struggled with the language, but not actually so much inside my shop because my shop there, the customers are all speaking English. And to some, actually, they speak even my local language because most of their nannies are actually Filipinas. So I had no issue with that. But outside my store, that's where the challenge started. <laughs> but I would say I think I kind of did it well because like, 
I would do you know sign language and I and when I go to the bakala the store here they call it bakala in the Philippines we call it sari sari store you know where you get all your grocery stuff in, in nearby store or just under your I mean in your building lobby or something like that but again it's a challenge because most of them are Indians Bangladesh or Egyptians so I don't really speak their language. So what I do is I just go around the store and pick what I want and then just pay for it. And I'm done with it, you know. But when you go to the malls, you know, that's another thing too. Because like if you go to a local mall or if you go to the local market, they all speak Arabic. And they don't understand a single word you say. But I think I manage it over the years, you know. So was able to get by. And another thing that I want to speak about is about the homesick. You know, when I first got here, I I really missed my kids. Now I'm alone here. And then on my days off, what do I need to do? You know, I miss my family. I had sleepless nights, worrying, asking myself, how my young kids are surviving without a father and a mother? Now, to many of us working overseas, not just women, I mean, meet men, men too, working and feeling the same way, I believe. Like, you know, their families are back in Egypt or back in Canada or back in wherever they come from, you know. And women are more emotional and expressive than men. Now, how did I fight this homesick sadness and loneliness? Well, after a month of being here in country, one of my flatmates actually was a member of the Toastmasters. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's actually a group of professionals who want to enhance, enhance their English and public speaking skills. So I gladly joined that and find it fascinating and was thrilled meeting people and networking. I learned a lot from different groups and it made me a better communicator. Now, my fear of being and speaking in a big crowd slowly diminish over time as I come to their meetings. You know, um, I have to stay away from the drama and being emotional, especially when I'm thinking about my kids, you know. I had to make it work. So I had to find something that I can divert my attention and make sure it helps me you know, get to where I want to be in less time, you know. And also, I always do walking by the seaside because that gives me a sense of peace and tranquility and somehow gave me the right perspective on where I want to go and what do I want to do while I'm here, what can I do to improve myself, not just professionally in my career, but as a person, you know? So that's how I, I, I reacted to this homesick, you know, dilemma that most women or most people, for that matter, experience while working overseas. Now, another thing that I would like to talk about is financial control and uh, stability. Well, providing for my three children, paying for the utility bills and bank loan was never easy for me at that time. You know, I was alone doing it for a few years and sacrificing, budgeting my money to spread the abundance and making sure my kids are well taken care for and pay for all the bills at the same time. And also, I have bills here to take care of. But I kept my focus and made sure that I do not spend beyond my means. Because I come here and I know I'm getting a little bit more of what I was getting back home. So I make sure I make a list. I made a list of all the things that I needed to pay for and get done and settled. And then the things that I have to do on a monthly basis and the, the things that I have to pay for on a daily basis for my sustenance, you know. Now, being debt-free for me 
gave me peace of mind and kept me on my purpose. And that is so clear to me because like I've witnessed some people here. They have been here for a long time and nothing happened to their lives. You know, I don't have any problem telling my kids whenever I come home for my vacation that this is the only money we have for right now. And this is for the bills. And this are, this is only the money left for us to do recreation. I am always transparent to them in their very little young age. I make them understand our financial standing because I believe once you are honest with the kids, they would understand. Maybe not instantly, but as they grow up, which was true with my kids. As they grew up, they understand why mom, mom is saying this and that. It was never easy. Don't get me wrong. Because mostly kids, of course, they don't understand, like, why is my mom working overseas and I cannot do this? I thought we have more money and we cannot still do this, you know? But I make them understand we have bills to pay, we have loan to pay, and this is the only money we can. I don't want to be borrowing money from anybody because that will give me more sleep, sleepless nights because I'm thinking, oh, my paycheck will have to go there right away because I owe some money here and there. I don't want that. And I don't want my kids to see that as well. So I made that promise to myself, you will live within your means. Now, to some people, some Filipinas I've witnessed, I'm not saying this is only true to Filipinas, but to some people, like, you know, their lifestyle changed. You know, so before they were not wearing that much gold, now they're wearing a lot of gold. I, I don't blame them because probably they never experienced that before. And now that they are earning more money, they think that, now I can afford it, but it got off hand, and then now all their paycheck goes to their you know creditors now so to some it's also addictive because like oh, on the sale time, I buy a lot more, you know, which at one time I did too, but you know when I realized no, I'm not gonna do it myself because I work in retail, so I know all the promotional you know um, calendar, and I know when this shop is gonna be on sale, and I need to buy it, you know things like that. But I realized it quickly, and I pulled myself away from that, and I want to make sure that hey, no, stop, Mirna, that's not why you are here. So. Um, it is quite sad, you know, because some people, they do it just to fit in. You know, when their friends are buying this, they have to, they want to buy the same amount of, of goods as well. And they feel that they have more friends if they do that. Because I've been in retail for a long time, you know, and I don't want to be in the mall actually because like I want to find some peace. And I go to the mall either in the morning time when less people there or when they're about to close. So people are all gone. You know, I don't want to be mixed with a lot of people. It's so crowded. You waste your time wait, waiting on the queue and the cashier. You know, that's not just me. And when I go to the mall or I go to a place, I know that I have a purpose there. And after that, and I leave, you know, so that I don't get to spend more, you know. Now, to some people, that's not it. I'll give some tips to the ladies, okay? It is more economical and practical to buy presents when or during sale or promotions. Now you get to save up extra bucks and give them, you know, uh, the things that you feel, you know, will amuse your family and keep it on the side and make it ready for your next uh, planned trip. In this way, you save uh, a lot of money and you're not in a rush in the last minute shopping. I mean, that's how you do it. 
I mean, it worked for me and I don't see any reason why for some women, instead of like just buying on the spot and then tomorrow you're traveling or the next day. So make it a habit to, you know, buy ahead of time, but don't buy much. Buy only the things that you think they might need or they might like. And uh, you save a, a lot of money in that time. Before coming to Kuwait, I had a 10-year working experience in a management role in several well-known establishments in the Philippines. Well, to my surprise, with my first company I worked for, some of the managers were not well-educated and less experienced too, but were getting fat paycheck because of their affiliation. And they call it here WASTA. And to some, because just because they're a native speaker or they speak the language. And, but to me, instead of dwelling on this sad truth and reality, I took that as an inspiration to motivate me to get better at what I do each day. So I started my way of motivating my people. And sure enough, we are always early bird. No, I hit my target. That's why we always uh, get recognition from the brand team as the early bird achieving the target before end of the month. How did I do that? Well, you know, I do my Monday training and I buy them breakfast with my small salary that time with my little money. I pay for it and not the company. <laughs> so I make sure my staff feels that I am genuinely concerned about them moving up. And I don't feel threatened that maybe if my staff knows more, then they will get ahead. I would be so happy and proud that I was part of that success. You know? So most of the managerial position here at that time, 16 years ago, were offered to male managers only, you know. But I was one of the luckiest people that you know, I get to be here and I was given the free hand on how I would run my shop. And... I believe you get that from, you know, the respect they gave you and they trusted all my, my marketing strategies that work for the store because you have to prove yourself that, hey, I know what I'm doing and I know what I'm saying. It's either you do it your way or you do it my way. And since uh, I've proven my worth and they trusted me to train their managers on the marketing strategies. Then I started making a little name, you know. But that didn't get into my head because to me, okay, I'm training managers. Uh, but, you know, I'm offered only 30 or 50, at that time, I think 50 KD increase by the company. It's still my salary was very close to an Arabic staff. But I didn't mind because to me, I know while I'm trying to learn about the country, the business, and the demographics, and the customer uh, data, then I learn from them, and they benefit from me as well while I do my strategies. So it's a win-win situation. And then later, I would apply for a better job, you know, once I know that I can handle it, and I know everything, and I know my way in and out then it will be easier for me to find a better job. So that's the main thing. Another thing that I'd like to talk about is relationships. Okay. Now, when you first got to a place that you are not familiar, you don't know the people, you know, and in my case, you know, people starting to know me as someone they can rely on, they can depend, and some people that they think that I am a genuine person, you know? So sometimes you feel being taken advantage of, you know? But 
to me, I don't look at it that way because I consider each one who has been part of my life as my teacher of life's lessons, you know. And we all know that people may come and go in your life. People might stay for a little bit because they are benefiting out of whatever you you two or you are having right now. But they come and go. And to me, it's more of like I condition myself that things are happening for a reason. People will befriend you for their benefit and not really concerned about your welfare. But to me, I give them a silent blessing, you know, because to me, I thank them that they were part of my life, that I ha- had to learn these valuable lessons. And also, it shaped up my value system, you know. And to me, it's more of like you have no control over how people will react to you, will accept you or will embrace or respect what you believe in. So the only control you have is your feelings, your beliefs, and your wants. So how do we want to, you know, live our life is actually on how we accept, we respect, and we embrace what we believe in and not impose that to the other person. If you... Learn how to accept, respect, and believe in yourself. Then you will look at the other individual the same way you look at yourself. You know? And whatever you see that might not be considered as pleasant or not ideal, you have a choice. Either you tell that person about it and you talk about it. Or you think about it first and try to absorb that and process that and know how you would react to it. And that's how it worked for me. (laughs) Because like anyone who has done some hurtful things to me, now they are all my friends actually. Because at first they shy away because they know what they did. But I welcome them and they're part of my family. I consider them part of my family because I've learned a lot from them. And I wouldn't be where I am now if not because of them. You know, so relationships will always depend on how you look at yourself and how you look at other people. And to me, I would live this relationship topic with or by by saying that the main thing with the relationship is setting that re- relationship is knowing first what you want and what you can offer and communicate clearly and come into terms with yourself first before getting into a relationship because once you know what you want and what you can offer then you can talk to it, talk about it to a partner, a friend, or a group, a colleague, or whatever it is, what type of relationship you're into. First know what you want and what you can offer. Then be clear about it. And, you know, because the main thing is if you set expectations, it's bound to fail. You know, it's bound to fail because your expectation is different from the other. Now, it can probably work out if you can come to a compromise. The hey, this is what I believe in. And is this okay with you or you approve of it? Or because once you are clear on what you want and what you can offer, everything will flow smoothly. But if you are, oh, I'm going to sacrifice this because this person doesn't want it. No, 
because you will get burnt over time. And you will say, I'm tired. I'm always giving way to you. I'm always understanding you. And it's bound to fail. And then later, you will not be able to fix it. You know? I know that for, from my experience because before before I get to this higher level of awareness, you know, this is what I grew up with. This is what I believe. This is what my parents taught me. So I should be this way. And I, I was, that was totally selfish because I thought the person that I have a relationship with or my colleague should believe the same way, my, should believe in what I believe in too. But that's kind of a self-centered thing, you know? So again, know what you want, what you can offer, be clear about it, and communicate. The main thing in any relationship is communication. Don't second guess your partner. Don't second guess your colleague. Some people might think, oh, if I ask this, maybe they will think I'm stupid or aunt. Don't worry about what they will say. Because regardless of what they say, you know, it's going to be on you if you don't ask that. Then if you are you know, living in the world that you want people to, you want to please people and you are always concerned on what they will say, you're not going to enjoy your life. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Now, quality time. You know, that's a big challenge for me too at that time. Because to me, time loss is lost forever. Now, my children grew up without me by their side. We had to face all the challenges without each other. School activities, birthdays, important events, graduation, sports fairs, when someone is sick, you know, and then the other's not there. Or simply when we feel sad, we do not have each other to hug or snuggle or a shoulder to cry on. I'm just fortunate that my sons are not drug addicts. They both have compassionate hearts always doing good and willing to help, not asking for anything in return. My older son doing outreach project for the community, he is like, a, a, we call it in the Philippines, Kagawad. He's one of the officers in the barangay. Now, my second son was at one time teaching hip-hop. He's a hip-hop dancer. Now, hip-hop moves to young children, so they won't get into drug addiction, street fight, gambling, smoking, and drinking, you know? And my daughter is so sweet that, you know, she would love to be with her, her friends. You know, she would console her friends and be there and simply not judge them for who they are, you know? So I am really so glad that God has been with us all these years, you know? So now, Gary, you're still there, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> so what I want to speak about now is the triumphs and victories of women working overseas, you know, because so much about the drama now of the, the challenges and the sacrifices. <laughs> First is I learned to value myself and my true and limitless potential. Now I started to take uh, classes to enhance and improve my, my skills. Like I took Arabic uh, lessons and then now I, I had the Toastmasters. I joined the orphanage as a volunteer. You know, anything, join a club or anything that would interest you so you will not feel you know homesick you will not be sad or you will not get into relationships that you should not be actually getting into you know and make sure you good, make good use of your time off work you know as for me i kept my promise of walking long distance on my days off you know i work i walk 9 kilometers four and a half one way and four and a half and i'm 51 you know and I also do meditation and I do yoga. And actually, I started uh, sharing. I call it a sharing community. I started my sharing community where I teach some um, yoga um, techniques 
to some people and I also prepare give it's for free I don't ask for anything because what I want this group to have is like you know what you learn from me you share it you know you share it to your family to your friends and I'll be happy to join you on you know whatever time is convenient for them if they want me to come to their their apartments to show them they're not uh, comfortable being in a group I would do that because I would do a personalized uh, coaching because my flexibility is not the same as some of the people in the group because I have been doing this for quite a while now. So some people, they probably would feel embarrassed that they cannot do a certain technique. So to me, I welcome anyone, you know, from six o'clock in the evening to eight o'clock. I'm here in uh, Sarah Complex teaching, you know, whoever will come, I accommodate them, you know. And to me, I feel so grateful that we have this job, we have this facility, and I am so fortunate that the company and the housing manager approve of my project. To me, it's more of like an outreach, reaching out to the women and making sure that they're okay, someone is there to take care of them, and someone is genuinely, you know, wanting to be, you know, to help them improve their health, their well-being, you know. So that's what I focus my, my, my attention now. Now also, now I've realized my sense of purpose. Now I do my own charity projects in my own small ways, you know, and part of that is also this sharing community. And then I also, on my days off, I have saved some money, you know, to continue distributing goods to the people here who are cleaning the streets. You know, Kuwait is very hot in summertime. So on my days off, I wake up like 4 o'clock in the morning, I go to Sultan Center, and I buy like biscuits, bottled water, fruits, three-in-one coffee, and uh, cookies, sugar, and things like that. And I put it in a bag, and I make sure I do 88 bags, because to me, eight is infinity. So the money keeps flowing. You know, I share my abundance, and the abundance comes to me. In multiple ways, you know, I'm not, I don't have a big fat check, but for some reason, God is giving me and I'm providing for my project, you know, so I deliver it uh, wherever God tells me. I drive to this place where I see the, the people, the men wearing green or wearing yellow, they're trimming the trees or cleaning the streets. I give it away and, you know, seeing them when I pass and I turn around and see them eat the fruit or drink the water that gives me a sense of joy that maybe these people don't have money to at least buy their drink or maybe they're so tired and you know they are so hungry and they don't have they don't have food and uh, you know waiting for them to be picked up by their service and that's one way of me helping them at least providing them with grocery bags and make them, you know, if they're hungry, they have something to eat. If they're thirsty, they have food. They go home, they have three-in-one coffee, they have tea bags. And, and to me, that's a sense of joy and fulfillment, you know, and seeing them waving at me, you know. It, it's, to me, it's simple joy and a, a simple gesture of kindness. And that's my lifestyle. That's, that's how I... I counter the homesick and I know that's one of my, my purpose in life, you know. Now, also while I'm here, I achieve a certain level of financial stability and security. Now I save up money to buy a new house and I save up money in the banks. I have three bank accounts and now people start what they see, what I do, they start donating money, you know, so I can do more and I can help more. You know, I don't know. I am not a, a big charity group. I don't know how to set up a company or a charitable institution. But maybe one day I will get there and someone will help me set that up. Because to me, whatever I receive, I give. The more I receive, the more I give, you know. 
because that's just how I, I've seen my, my mother and my father did it. You know, my mom, when he, she cooks, she makes sure that she shares with our neighbors. When my dad did something for the community, like, you know, I, I see that. I witnessed that from, you know, from my, my young age. So I get to continue that, you know. Even my grandmother, my dad's uh, mom, you know, when she cooks, she cooks for the whole neighborhood, you know, and gives her. At that time, I didn't understand that. I thought that she was just wasting money and she's not a millionaire, but now I know because I'm doing it myself. Like, wow, like this is, I'm really happy. It's not about how much money I have in the bank. But see these people eating all this food, like gives me like a sense of happiness. You know, how I wish I can, I can, you know, my next project is having an elderly home set up in the Philippines that we can take care of our, our old people like for their families to be able to drop them off in, in the center that I want to put up and, you know, they can work, you know, so they will not be poor forever because some people, they, they don't have anyone to take care of their mom, their grandparents. So they're all stuck there taking care of each other with little money because some people who can actually work cannot because they, they cannot afford to pay someone to take care of their elders and and i really want to do that you know but inshallah one day i will be able to do that if not maybe my kids will continue the legacy that i started and another thing is i, I i'm not concerned about the dollar or peso value of everything i do no because once you you do that like i would do this because this is how much i will get you know, you are setting a parameter on which that you are limited. You know, I do what I do now, not because I can afford it, but because I want it. Once you have reached that certain stability in your life, you change the way how you think. As Dr. Wayne Dyer, my, men my mentor, would say, change your thoughts, change your life. It has a big influence in my life, you know. I consider him as one of my best gurus that I've learned a lot from, you know. When I started, and, and that concept is also with Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu is a simple man, you know. Because some of us, once we get to a certain level, we edge God out, as Dr. Wayne says, you know, edging God out, E-G-O, ego, the big ego. We take over and we think that we can do it now because we are equipped with all these high-tech gadgets. We are equipped with all this, this high education and all that. And we, we feel that we are mighty and greatest because of who we've become, you know. Later, you will be without them when you leave this world, you know. I'm not saying there's something wrong. Actually, I thank the people, the geniuses who created the technology that make this podcast possible. And now you can contact your, your kids, even they are out there in the Philippines and I'm here. We can see each other. So that homesick is gone now because of the available resources we have now. So make use of it, make good use of it and not use it to, to deteriorate and to make yourself worse and to abuse people and to get you off your real purpose. Use whatever you have now, the resources you have, the technology you have to reach out to people, to do what you want and to make sure that you progress from there, you know? Because it's not just all about your title. It's not just all about who you are now. There's more to life than that. You know, if you're a mother now, it's not just about, you know, um, raising your kids because later your kids would have their own families and now you will feel like I'm alone again. So from this time, that's why I'm sharing these this experiences with you. From now that you are on your young age, it is really good that this information, these resources are available to you for you to use 
as tools to guide you. During my time, there's nothing like this. And I'm not a high-tech person. I don't know. Even now, I have a Samsung S10 Plus. I don't even know how to use that. I use that just for video call with my kids and uh, to send messages to my teammates in the work. And that's about it. But the other functionalities, the only reason why I got that phone is because my S6 died. You know, if it did not, then I would still probably having a Samsung S6, you know. But it doesn't bother me because it's not about what I have. It's about how I live my life, you know. And that goes to another point, which is a sense of freedom to discover your creativity. Because once you free up yourself of your title, you know, my responsibilities here and there, everything will flow smoothly, you know. And then you enjoy doing what you want to do. And you get to do it. Because like once you are, okay, I have to be doing this. And I'm tired. I work 10 hours. I need to get some rest. If you don't change that, you know, mentality, then I'm 51 and I'm doing yoga every day. Sometimes three times a day, you know. Young people would say, oh, I don't have time because you don't want, there's time. Time is there. It's just how we manage it. So if you keep on making excuses, you're not going to get anywhere. And I actually thank you, Gary, because now that I have this now, so I know, you know, I get to budget my time. I need to write my, my podcast topic. I need to start writing my book. I need to, you know, when I did that uh, webinar on writing a book. So I devote my time half an hour. And if I miss half an hour today, I make sure the following day I do an hour. Or if I miss all that, because like, like yesterday, I work from 6.30 to 10.15 p.m. Imagine that long hours. But I still had the energy when I reached home. I still did some of my uh, meditation and yoga techniques because I don't limit my time. Oh, I'll be so tired uh, when I, I just you know, sleep, sleep of four hours. I'm, I'm over that now. You know, because I know with like an hour of meditation or maybe a 30 minutes of meditation or 15 minutes of meditation, that is equivalent to an hour of my rest time because I'm at peace with myself, you know. And actually, when I woke up, I felt like, oh, my God, my head is so heavy. But what did I do? Every day, I drink turmeric with a pinch of uh, ground pepper mixed with lemon and uh, uh, apple cider. And I mix all that, and I warm it up, and that clears my head, my nose, my sore throat, and everything. And that keeps me you know, healthy and slimmer, too. You know? So there's a lot of benefits. Once you, once you are on that certain level that you are at peace with yourself, then you start to take care of yourself, know your priorities, you know, you're not limited to your title. You do a lot of things that is of higher purpose, you know? And I would like to close by saying that another triumph for me and victory is your happiness starts with you. You can't be looking for happiness outside of you. Your happiness cannot be dependent on the person that you are with right now. Because before you can make others happy, you have to be truly happy yourself first. Because if you're not, then you will end up like sacrificing because you have to give way to this. You have to compromise with this. No, it's either you accept the person or you accept your situation and make it work for you or you get into this emotional chaos and not achieve anything at all. 